This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. Last time in part one, we saw how an echo parakeet chick had been collected from the forest on Mauritius, an Indian Ocean island. Wow, it's quite big. Yeah, 50 grams. Hello. Hello, Dansari. Take the crop around. Quite all right. Once down to only 12 known individuals, the struggle was on to save the species and not let it become extinct like the infamous dead as a dodo. Yeah, I think we can do with half it in. <laughs> and it's not just the echo parakeet that's been in trouble. The pink pigeon down to a mere 10. And last and least, the Mauritius kestrel. Almost gone at four, just four in the whole world. So, any more dodos? is a massive challenge. Chicks of various ages are kept here and they're reared in spotless lab conditions. Especially nutritious food at the right temperature, like the parent would provide, but not exactly like this. In the wild, it's called regurgitation. Here it's by the teaspoon, and that's your lot. It's looking good. Now for squirt, not sure why, and companion. Bigger than the one before. Eyes, feathers. Here's a squirt and a noisy breakfast. Still bits of fluff left on this one. Proper wings and a serious beak. Thanks to care and captive breeding, they're increasing in the wild, although the original forest has been much reduced and overtaken by alien plants like guava and privet. They were once presumed to be only visible later in a museum joining the extinct dodo and another nearly gone species, the pink pigeon. 
ground living dodo, a giant pigeon, was flightless, an easy prey to predators, especially man. It was known for only a hundred years, the last one seen apparently in 1662. And are there more extinctions to come? For example, the Mauritius kestrel, down to four birds, surely a contender as the biggest loser. The pink pigeon could then be seen easily after a short boat trip from the glamorous beach life of the main island to a much smaller island undergoing important repairs. Multilingual guides have jobs here. And boatmen too. If the locals can see that wildlife, even a pigeon or a lizard, can bring money and jobs, they'll probably help it. That includes the vegetation, in the past destroyed along with the dodo. Today we have a better understanding of ecology, environment and nature conservation. It's too late to save the dodo, but the plants, like some very rare special types, can be rescued and propagated, a kind of big gardening. Very easy to grow. The label says critically endangered. The original vegetation, the big forests, were felled by the settlers. A flora and fauna had evolved dependent on this unique plant base. It was shattered. Now that damage is being repaired. And as the seedlings are planted out, some of the original inhabitants have returned. The elegant pink pigeon, once down to just 10, now is a tourist attraction with its own arrangements. Well, who's viewing who? Part of the day out is a visit to the information centre. It's been helped by Japan, the Egrets Egrets Island by British royalty. And it provides a reminder of this giant flightless pigeon, the dodo, and a warning about those other species at risk. Visitors hear about another island where just one unique tree is left in the wild. On Round Island, goats ate everything else. Now the hurricane palm is being propagated and the unique reptiles being bred in captivity in England, on Jersey in the Channel Islands by the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. As we'll see, that's a rescue effort a long way from islands in the region of Mauritius where man killed off the dodo with the help of his imported friends. That's monkeys, pigs, cats, dogs, rats, which plundered dodo's nests. But this species survived the onslaught with a lot of help from its friends. Now the Mauritius kestrel has increased from just four to become a tourist attraction with its own show. Well, on its own terms, that is. <laughs> The show must go on, but will it? Well, try whistling. Come on, girl! 
The audience is getting restless. More arrive. The pressure's building. But the donkey doesn't care. More of interest to come. Like a cannon from the old days. Now a home in the wild, a bit of a surprise. It was manufactured in the First World War. But it was put here before the Second World War. They're having a deco, well, as a look. For a gecko, a kind of lizard. He's well adapted to live in an old cannon. His foot suckers work well in any direction and there are plenty of places to hide away from the piercing eyes of a hungry kestrel. They're not all fed show birds. A hunting kestrel eats geckos and lizards and they eat ants. A food chain right here. That's if they can find the ants by sliding about. When they do find them, there's plenty to choose from. Decisions, decisions. And even then, there's not much meat on an ant. But enough of them will help growth and make a bigger meal for that kestrel watching up there. Kestrels have recovered well and have adapted to all kinds of habitats, many using nest boxes. The Mauritius kestrel will never be anywhere near as abundant as it was when the island still retained its forest cover 400 years ago. But it has not gone the way of so many other species, once common on this Indian Ocean island, parts of which are now protected. The story of the dodo symptomatic of the enormous destruction of the natural habitat is a classic example of how rapidly a wild species can slide into oblivion. The Mauritius kestrel too came within a whisker of extinction. We might very easily not have had it today. There were no backup populations in zoos. But forward thinking and urgent action some 40 years ago saved the day and the kestrel. So it now flies into a promising future. And humans, with the power to change the planet, to rescue wildlife, or destroy it like the dodo in its home on Mauritius, we leave that hot sunny island for a cooler one. But the dodo's still in our sights. On Jersey, in the English Channel Isles, another dodo welcomes visitors to the headquarters of the Durrell Wildlife Trust, now called a park, not a zoo. Now here's a familiar face, a pink pigeon, regarded rather unflatteringly, perhaps, as backup a safety population being bred in zoos, amongst which Jersey is a very active and successful participant. Now, statistics vary, but the trend is up. 
their prospects are good. Now they usually pair for life and the female lays two white eggs and incubation is for two weeks. The male during the day and the female during the night. They may breed often laying five to six eggs in a season. The future is pink for this beauty which so nearly went the way of the dodo. Pink pigeons may be pretty to some, but to others, especially children, it's the weirder ones that get them excited. A hungry tortoise. And an iguana, a mini dinosaur, looks at them. They can spot and hear little frogs from the rainforest. Some very poisonous. The mountain chicken is very rare and tasty. Its local name explains its problem. From the Caribbean, they're trying to breed it in Jersey. The iguana is still looking around. Something has caught his beady eye. It's a lizard displaying. It's amazing what you can see in these little bits of the wild. Here, hopefully, for their own good and their own kind, and for the visitors, of course. It's a form of education, using the dodo as a symbol of endangered species. In this case, a whole endangered island with its plants and animals. Not that many are interested in saving rare snakes, but the round island boa is getting the dural treatment. And the plan is to restore the island to its original condition, which is a really big challenge. So is breeding them and feeding them. It's all part of the job. Singing frogs. Powerful pythons, not venomous but very constricting. And safe here away from the fashion trade for skins. To cuddly gentle lemurs from Madagascar. And endangered parrots bashing bark. They're all here, care of the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust, founded by Gerald Durrell.
of Gerald Durrell's greatest legacies is this, is this integration between his staff that's based here at the wildlife park and the staff in the field. It's just something that's unique in the zoo world and the conservation world. You know, nobody does it like Durrell. And this, the integration between the two, the kind of understanding, the rapport, the um, input, the help, the support that's given between these people is just of incalculable value. Durrell um, runs conservation projects all around the world, but the pe people in Jersey don't really know the full breadth of what we do. And there's almost the same number of people that work in Jersey working overseas on conservation projects in diverse tropical regions, islands, uh, mountain areas. It's, it's a very interesting um, program. But we have very little opportunity to bring those people together. So the Conservation Symposium is an opportunity once a year to do that. And we've brought around 20 people, researchers, external experts, our own staff together to discuss how well we've done, what are the big pressures we're facing, and what the future holds. He is five years old. Um, female bear, she came to us from Germany. She's a lovely, temperamented bear. She's really sweet, really personable with the keepers. She, she likes a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. She is our male bear. They get on amazingly, both him and Bahia, from the day they met, really. They kind of took one look at each other and just ran off playing, wrestling, and, and it was brilliant to watch. So that whole first year was really playful because they were still so young. The birth itself was quite uneventful in itself. We have all of these brilliant images from the footage, from the cameras we have placed in the den. So now we can monitor her check on the condition of the cub and see that it's doing well without having to disturb her at all. Because in this species, leaving them alone during the cubbing nesting period is crucial. Any disturbance can affect the mother-cub relationship. So the, the more hands-off we can be, the better the chances the cub will be raised happily by its mother. There have been very many highlights. And when I went to Mauritius, it was working with the rare birds. And I started with the pink pigeon and the Mauritius kestrel, both of which were critically endangered at the time. And the kestrel in the 1970s went down to single figures. In 1974, there were only four individuals left in the wild. And we were able to restore that with captive breeding and reintroduction. And then we moved on to the pigeon, the parrot. And then in more recent years, we've been working on the endangered passerines, the small songbirds in Mauritius. But I've always enjoyed going and working on the remote islands. And I always thought, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we could really restore these? And of course, Jerry Durrell was, was always very interested in Round Island, and we had many of the reptiles here in the zoo. And it was always our goal to try and put those islands back to something like they would have looked like before man modified them and introduced rabbits and goats. So what started very modestly breeding the odd bird in a cage and thinking that one day we might be able to release them, it's grown into a movement on the island, restoring uh, the native habitats, putting back these critically endangered species and training people, the next generation of young conservation biologists.